Hello and welcome to the Recipes for Success podcast. I'm your host and the CEO at Zupa, Ollie Brand. Now, our guest on the podcast today is Matt Grimshaw. He's the founder of Uda. It's a people experience platform focused on hospitality businesses. Uh, the, the idea is is focused on the employee experience and really making the experience for them the most the best it can be. Now, Matt and I get a little bit technical at some points during this podcast, but. What I hope you take away from this, two things. One is Matt shares some incredible perspectives around around the people experience, around your people strategy and putting them at the center of your business. And there's potentially some ideas that he shares. He's living and breathing it with what he does with Yuda. And he shares some of the exciting things they're up to. And it, it, it kind of gives some insights and, and really cool ideas of what you could put to work within your business tomorrow uh, around your people strategy. But the other thing is also helping remove some of the fear and uncertainty around new technologies, things like artificial intelligence coming through and how that can actually really boost your business and, and, and help you um, if, if it's got a really def- well-defined purpose and isn't technologies for, technology for technology's sake. So, uh, you know, a really interesting discussion. It's slightly different to what, what we normally go through, but I think if you, you know, if you can take any learnings from this, I think that it's around those two, two main points. So for now, sit back, relax and enjoy. Matt, thank you so much for coming down. It's wonderful to have you here. I'd, I'd love to kick off by just getting a bit of a background on yourself and, and who you are. Uh, thank, well, thanks for having me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name's Matt. Uh, I'm the founder of Yuda, uh, which is a, a new HR tech startup uh, for hospitality uh, that we, we started about um, about nine, nine months or so ago. Um, and uh, But Yuda really is the sort of combination of about 15 years of work. So I, before Yuda, I was a consultant working in the sort of people and culture space. Um, both with hospitality businesses and other types of types of organizations and um yeah it's like if you keep making mistakes for 15 years and and keep trying to learn how to get better uh you just kind of the answer to that it's like oh i think i've spotted what what's missing and what people need in order to uh to try and create the people experience and the culture that they want within their organizations that sounds fantastic i, I think if um i'd love to understand a bit more about like what the pull was to hospitality so why did you why did you dive into the hospitality sector so yeah so as a consultant um uh we work with a number of really great hospitality brands um and I th- and, and and as like lots of people i mean i've had first-hand experience of working in hospitality in, in jobs you know student and that sort of thing um i think you just it has a very special appreciation for people I think hospitality, like the, the, the magic of the experience really comes down to the interaction of a team and how they convey that to customers. Um, and you get, um, you, you get great people everywhere, but you get lots of great people in hospitality. You get people who really care, people who really look after each other. Um, and then from a technology perspective, like I just don't think people have got the tools they need to achieve what they want to on people and culture. And, you know, you know someone trying to build technology, I came across a stat the other day, like 80% of the world's workforce uh, are non-desk workers, right? They go and do something when they're not at desk. But to date, only 1% of VC funding has gone to addressing the the, the, the needs of non-tech workers. That's mad. And, and, and hospitality is, you know, in that that bucket of, I think, a market that's been a little bit underserved by, by HR tech, if I'm honest. Um, and where the users have a different set of needs, like you, you, you know, it has to be mobile first, and, and it has to work in a in a context where you're not looking at a screen all day, you know. So I th- I think that's really interesting. And then there's obviously a market dynamic at the moment, which is you know, let's be honest, the tide's gone out. You know, two three years ago, it, you, people didn't have a recruitment problem, and all of a sudden, you've got you know, pretty pretty prominent hospitality brands who are shutting their doors early because they haven't got enough team members. Uh, and so everyone's really woken up to actually our people experience matters. Like if we want to grow our business, we have to attract people. We have to be able to retain them. We have to be able to get engaged them. We have to make them productive. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I just think it's a really interesting moment now where people are focused on it, where there's an opportunity to do new and interesting stuff with technology. And from a personal point of view, like an opportunity to to work with great people, you know, and, and I, you know, my, my, my own personal story, if you like, is uh, 
I'm a pretty convinced atheist, right? I think you've got 50, 60 years of useful life and then they're going to stick you, stick you in a box. Uh, you're going to spend about 25 years of that asleep. So that's, that's a big chunk that's just gone. And then the next biggest investment of your time is going to be work. And, you know, for most people, works, you know, if you ask me, it's like, work's fine. You know, like it's a kind of mm. mediocre experience. Um, and, and that strikes me as a, like, like that, that, that chimes with me as a problem worth solving. Does that make sense? And I think in hospitality, 100%. people have good shifts, they have bad shifts. But this general sense of like, oh, it's a bit mediocre, or it's like, it could be a lot better, is, is the thing that I just really like the idea that you can use technology and work with people and enable them to get to a space where you actually make a, a, a real impact on real people. You know, that's, that's something that, that I'm quite passionate about, if I'm honest. Like, and, and it's that drive to like, actually, for, can you have the data that shows you're having an impact on people? Mm. Um, yeah, that's it. So, yeah. That, I mean, that is an absolutely fascinating perspective. And I think, especially when you look at it that way, where it's sort of 60 years and 20 years of that is, is spent sleeping and all that. And I think it just going back to that point you mentioned about the investment and about uh, non-desk work and, and that. And do you think generally that that's a sort of a, a reflection of possibly the lack of respect for the sector or uh, as a sector within the UK in general, or is this global as well, you're saying? Uh, it's, it's a global dynamic. Like, you know, the, the, the investment in technology gra- it gravitates where, 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 you know, financial services, technology companies themselves, you know, they, they, so, and I do think you're right. I think there is a, a sense in which hospitality is almost like a second class job or a second class mm. career. Um, we see that come up time and time again. It's like, it's absolutely a, a perception with, with everything that we. And I think it's, uh, it was really interesting. You said like, you see all the AI stuff come over uh, out in the last, you know, three months or so. What's really interesting uh, to me is the, the technology is going to take out the jobs, I think, in the reverse order to which everyone expected, right? Mm. If you look at what the AI can do in creative space, it's in- phenomenal, like the ability to create images and websites and write copy and all those sorts of things. And those creative jobs, I think, were the ones that people thought were most distinctly human and going to be the last to go. I think they'll probably be the first to be affected. Then it's going to be the white collar workers, you know, like lawyers, accountants. They, that, that, and actually the last jobs that could be affected by this in terms of like mass disruption are going to be things like health and social care and hospitality and, you know, they, where you actually have to have a, a human. Um, and I think it's going to make everyone reevaluate how we see jobs and how we see I mean, I don't mean to get like, but the, like the dignity of work around, you know, a job in hospitality and what it means and that ability to to have an impact on someone else's life, you know, that you have in hospital, you can make you can make someone happy. Mm-hmm. Um, computers can't do that, you know, to that same, you can't make those moments of human connection. And I, I hope that, um, I hope that we come to reevaluate how important the skill, because it is a skill, it's a real practical skill. You watch great operators and great people on the front lines and see that practical skill, that ability to influence how someone feels in a moment, um, I think is really important. Yeah, and, and the fact that it's considered a, a secondary, uh, second-class citizen thing, it's not, uh, I mean, uh, our mutual connection, Kieran, uh, met, mentioned this when he came on the podcast as well, where saying like, as a soft skill, it's, it's such a, a poor reflection of what it is because it is it's hard work and being able to do that is uh, and work long shifts and do the various other bits and it sort of it doesn't it definitely deserves more respect and investment and focus generally and I think better things will come of that. Yeah, I, um, I as a consultant, I did some work with Honest Burgers and I remember having a conversation with someone there uh, who was a med student at Birmingham University. And he said, you know, the reason I love Honest is because I'm learning all of my medical training and, you know, how to cut people up or whatever it is you do at med school uh, at Birmingham. But I'm learning all about how to manage people and engage with people at Honest. Mm-hmm. And that's that sort of stuck with me for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, because you can, uh, you, those practical skills about how you deal with people, you can only learn by doing and observing other people doing and practice. You can't learn them out of a textbook. And they're critically important to yourself. Whether you stay in hospitality or go on to do something else, those skills are the things that will make, as soon as you have your 
effectiveness comes about can you get other people to do stuff you know mm. it's those skills are really those are things that make you you know really uh stand out as a leader or, or in a in whatever walk of life you end up in and that it's, i've been talking to people at um at mcdonald's in the states recently so in the states one in eight people have worked for mcdonald's at some point in their life one in that's eight that's incredible right and you think about the potential impact on how the ripple effects, not just in hospital, beyond hospitality of like, what if you give people a great experience where they learn how to manage difficult conversations or difficult people, they learn how to inspire people or make connections with people. Like the ripple effect of that in an economy, I think is really, could be really huge. Um, so I think I'm, I'm a skeptical, if you like, I, I, people will always have careers in hospitality and, and that's great. I think, we've also got to think about great episodes in hospitality, you know, like the great summer job, the great, you know, job you took for a year or when you were returning to work after, you know, parental leave or something like that. How do you create great episodes within hospitality that really give people those skills that, that set them up for whatever they want to do next? Mm. And I think, uh, yeah, my, it, it, like my little hobby, what's it like? It's like, how do you make an episode that, that like, stands out as a peak experience for someone in their in their life and gives them skills, whether they stay in hospitality or move on to do something else that they like really valued. Mm. Um, yeah, I'd love it if people recognize more of that in, in in what you can do within a in a hospitality business. Yeah, certainly. And I think if if that was something that um I couldn't agree more. If if it was something that was sort of worked in and met and systemized more, I guess, in a way. Uh, people would have more empathy and more, like yeah. and more understanding and and you know just the general ripple effect would be significant. I think you, I think you can tell people who've had a job in hospitality, right? You watch at the end of a meeting who tidies up their stuff and who doesn't, and I bet it correlates with whether they've had a job in hospitality yeah, or not. Certainly. And like you, like it's like it teaches to work hard. Like you have to, you know, it's it's a hard, yeah, a busy shift on a Friday night or a Saturday night that finishes at one in the morning. Like it, it's good. There's like it's good habit stuff that you get from it. Uh, yeah, I think it really does stick with you. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. Um, you, you mentioned as well that, so the tide's gone out uh, and, and the people shortages and that's a, that's a challenge that we've, you know, it's been front and centre uh for for the last year i mean maybe even longer and you you will be living and breathing this at the moment in terms of what is it a business can do to to differentiate themselves and and make sure that they're not a business that struggles with people shortages in the hospitality space yeah i think it's 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 a tough one when you find yourself in that situation because um i think the immediate lever you reach for is obviously recruitment we need to we need to find people and hire people um <laughs> And you, you do need to do that. Like, like the, the challenge is you also probably need to make some changes to how you're treating your people and their experience of working with you as well. Because otherwise you can, you can fix your recruitment problem and get more people in the door. But if you just end up churning them, actually you're getting back into that vicious cycle where you're going to get a worse and worse reputation and actually recruitment is going to become harder and you're going to lose people and those sorts of things. So you, you, there's, there's, I th I guess the the the, the uh, unhelpful but like genuine answer. There's no quick fix. Like mm. if you, it, the, you 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 you've got to do the hard work. You have got to make sure that when you've got new employees, you onboard them properly. You you get them feedback from people so you can improve over time. You're investing in your people experience. You're investing in understanding what's making your teams tick. Understanding the behaviours you need from managers. Those sorts of things. Um, and my personal view is um, people management's a system right so and what i mean by that is there's no one measure of value within people management right it's different in marketing and sales you've got this there's a measure right are you selling more or less and because of that you can test all your tactics do they make the the, the sales go up or down people management's different right they, you want because you've got more than one measure of value you want your people to be happy. You also want them to be healthy. You want them to be productive. You want them to deliver good service. You know, like there's, mm. there's more than one indicator of whether, and because of that, you only really get value at that systemic level. The challenge is most people approach HR or people management like it's whack-a-mole at the fairground. Like we've got a recruitment problem, so we'll whack that one. We've got a training problem, we've got, whack, you know, we've got a service mm. problem. We've got, oh, we need to give them incentives. Um, and, and you 
if you get into that mentality, basically you're trying to optimize components of the system. Not try, It's like having all the parts of the car, but not putting them together. That's mm. basically what HR is like at the minute. And so you see a, a rec- you see a short, we don't have enough team members. And the instinct is, it's a recruitment problem. It's not. It's like, you've got to, what you've got to do is think about how you reshape the system so you get to a better place. Um, uh, and that's tricky, if I'm honest. Um, but if you just try and optimize the component, actually, you can make the situation worse. Mm. Is that it? I mean, in summary, it's basically saying it's got to be a, a fundamental piece is to make sure you've got a people-led culture. You've got, you really do put your people first and any changes are authentic. It's not a sort of sur- surface level plaster that you're putting on. It's It's got to be right at the core of the business. Yeah, I think at the moment, this is kind of the challenge we're trying to answer with you, right? At the moment, no one has the data that gives them that systemic perspective. Right, most people's data sits in a silo. They've got a bit of data on recruitment. If they've got an ATS, they've got a bit of data on rotary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they, no one's got a real systemic perspective. In the absence of that data, my experience, what happens is you get really experienced operators who've got the benefit of thirty years of trying stuff and failing, or trying stuff and succeeding, and they've got this instinctive view about what works and what doesn't work. And one of the things I think you see in those sorts of people is this, what I would think of as quite an oblique approach. Does that make sense? They, they tend to go like, we just do the right stuff and eventually the right stuff will come back to us. Um, and so they don't jump on like, what's the latest faddy initiative or like those sort of component things. They tend to take more of a systemic perspective. What we're trying to do with Yuda is give people the data so that they can test that instinct and and have confidence in 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 the mm. right conclusions for that instinct because at the moment there aren't the tools to do it well like you can't you can't take a real data-led approach to how you build out your people experience and how you build out your culture mm. so sort of uh, accumulating all the insights and work playing them off each other effectively yeah and you've got uh you know amazon knows more about your employees than you do right mm. amazon knows when the well, you probably know where they're both, but Amazon knows if they've got kids. Amazon knows if they've got caring responsibilities. Amazon knows if you're, you know, refitting your house. Or, like, is, uh, and actually, once you get to a certain scale, once you get in past like 150, 200 people, unless you have that sort of data, it's very difficult to create an interesting experience for people. Mm. Like, if you, if all the data you have on your people is their job title, their address, their national insurance number, and you know, th- th- you can't create an, a, a, an experience that feels personal or engaging or, or resonant. So with you, one of the things we're doing is how do you use uh, digital experience to start to understand your people better? Mm. You know, like, so you can ask them questions about stuff. You can understand, like, why did you join us? What would make you leave? Um, through to, you know, what do you want to do next? Or like, it, well, I know it sounds silly, but like, uh, what's the uniform size? Like, you know, like the amount of times I've turned up to work a trial shift somewhere and not had, I've been in a uniform that's mm. too small or massive. I did a shift, was like a 10 hour shift in shoes that were two sizes too small. I'm like, like it's, it's a bad experience. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, bit, the, the start of it for me is you've got to, you've got to have some way of getting more data and, and data that give, gives you a way of learning over time and a data that gives you a way of creating a more personalized, more responsive experience for people. Yeah, I, that's incredible. And you, so you, you're with, with you, you're in the sort of the stage, you're, you're building the product, you're getting the, the MVP out and you're, you're kind of building a better understanding and, and these insights will start to, to come. For the listeners though, right now, what what insights can you share that fr- from what you said, so the example you gave me the, uh, earlier is about the, the, the McDonald's example um, of two people over the over a certain age, if they're on shift, things are much better. But do you have any insights that you could share up front that people could think will oh, actually put that to work? The, 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 one of the things that informs what we're trying to do with Yuda is a, a concept from social psychology called the fundamental attribution error. Right? And the fundamental attribution error is uh, a cognitive bias. We all like to see the world or interpret what's going on in the world as a person acting on the environment to achieve a certain motivation. Um, and because of that, we tend to be blind to the situational and environmental effects on our behavior. And actually, most of the social psychology is, being, is, is about that the, the context in which someone's working is a better predictor of their behavior than anything you know about them. 
right? Now, in the HR space, what that means is we spend ages trying, like, you know, personality tests or, you know, all this sort of thing, and none of it has any real predictive ability. Um, that's, that's a bit unfair. It has some predictive ability. Um, what tends to be a better predictor of people's behavior or outcomes is what's going on around them. Right. So let's take 90 day turnover, which is a big thing in the industry at the moment. Like we're, we're hiring, we managed to sort of recruitment, we're hiring people. Why are so many of them leaving within the first three months? Now, what people tend to do is gravitate towards like, are we hiring the right people? Are they resilient enough? Like, what do we need to know about the person that's going to be ultimately successful in this environment? And they tend to be blind to what's the context in which we're putting them, you know, like, and it can often be really simple things like, have we given people two days off in a row? Or if we made them work their first th th 90 days and, and they've never had two days off in a row. Or what does what does their journey look like through onboarding? Like, did we put them on a Friday night on their second shift and stress them out? You know, like, or did we stagger it up nicely? So it's trying to, my thing is I always try to find those situational or contextual influences on people's experience and their behavior. Because one, they, they tend to matter, actually, if you were to express they, but actually they're the things you can control for and can do something about. So yeah, if people have got like challenge, if they've grabbed me, I'm always like, try and see what's the context. How is that influencing the behavior? How could you change the context in order to get the, the result you want? Now that, that's really interesting. So, and then in practice, if, if someone had these insights and I guess anyone listening is probably going to be, you know, getting quite introspective about looking at their, their technology, uh, their people management technology, but what does that look like in practice with rotor management and things like that? Well, at the moment, I think if you've got a rotary tool, it'll probably predict how many hours you want for a given shift. Uh, where we'd like to get to with Uda is, is not just how many hours you need, but what's the optimum mix of people on that team in order to achieve a particular result. Uh, so one of the things we're looking at at the moment is uh, team cohesion. So, uh, uh, and uh, the... The idea is that the, the the longer a team spends together, as a general rule, the more the easier they find it to work with each other. And team cohesion may well be a good predictor of performance. So if you have so if you have a stable team, all other things being equal, you'd expect them to outperform a team that's got high churn. Um, so yeah, how do you how do you look at not just how many hours you need, but who who on that who who you put on that shift? And if you're in, let's say you've got a new starter how do you put them on a shift with a stable team or with, you know, people like, and it makes it sound like really sophisticated, but really what you're saying is let's make sure we have some people on the team who know what they're doing and who are comfortable and confident and look after the people that we've just added into this, this team rather than, you know, let's put all three of our new starters on the same, same shift in their first week, you know, mm -hmm. like it's those mm -hmm. sorts of simple things. Um, and then for us data wise, I'm really interested in how you give the value of people's data back to them. So let's say maybe it turns out that you're the, you know, you're you're awesome on a Friday night when we're busy, you know, and it just so happens we put you on the team on Friday night, there's a little spike in performance of of sales and that sort of thing. Well, how do we give you the benefit of that? Like, can we pay you more for the Friday night? Or, you know, how do you incentivize people so that they're they uh, or if maybe you're the person that that if you're if you're rated with a new starter, it gives them a great experience. They identify that with their feedback and actually, you know, you make it 15% more likely that they stay. Again, how do we give you the benefit of that back? Um, so, yeah, th I think the, the the thing for me is there's some, like, common sense stuff. It, there's some stuff that's, like, uh, the practical wisdom of good operators. Hmm. Like, you know, like, practices people just pick up over time or probably aren't even conscious of. Um, like, you know, how you wrote a new starters, all those sorts of things. What we're trying to do with you is, is just elevate the visibility around some of those stuff and then nudge people towards doing it when they weren't aware of, of the impact of it. Uh, for someone listening who, who, who are thinking about team, you know, team cohesion is, is an important topic, do you have any just immediate suggestions uh, in terms of what they could do to support team cohesion just in general? Uh, I suspect they do. Most people are doing it. Like you've, you know, if you're a restaurant manager, like you've probably got a feel for who likes working with whom. Mm. You know, uh, all we're trying to do with you is to give you some data around that. Like, who do people appreciate working with? Um, and then do, do, does that appreciation in some way correlate with the pattern of the week? Do you know what I mean? Like, maybe you and I 
are great to be with, working with each other on a Tuesday afternoon. And we, you know, it's a bit quieter and we have a chat, but actually we, we, we completely get on each other's nerves on a, Friday, on a Saturday. Um, yeah, so it's trying, so I think there's, you know, if you're actually working in it at the moment, you just have an eye for this stuff and great operators do have an eye for this stuff. Um, what we're trying to do with you, and this is what I think all technology and hospitality ought to be there is how do you augment that? Like, you, like the technology's got to be like, I don't know, the stuff Batman has. Does that make sense? Like, it's just got to be like, make you a bit better at this. Just make mm. you aware of something that a bit sooner than you would have otherwise been aware of it and those sorts of things. So like, yeah, when we get feedback from people about, yeah, we, who did you appreciate working with? Mm. You know, you can pass that on to restaurant managers so you can see what, like, so you can see what's happening in the shifts that they aren't there. Mm. Uh, they can see the dynamics that, you know, it, it, it's those sorts of things. You're just trying to augment good people management rather than, I think this is the most important thing for me. And what I'd hate to happen with you is if people feel like uh, it's either trying to take away from the judgment of the, the, the individual, the manager, or getting in the way of, of having a good proper conversation. Does that make sense? You mm. know, like, this is really why at the moment we're fo so focused on trying to automate processes to give people time back is because you need to create space for that human connection. And that's what the technology should, should be trying to in help you do rather than producing HR tech that ends up with a manager hiding in their office doing the road. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, makes so, sense. Makes um, sense. Yeah, I don't know if there's a, um, I guess if it's like, you know, if you're pushing for like, oh, what's an immediate thing I can do differently? In my experience of consulting with some great operators in lots of great businesses, the biggest difference is literally what people see. You know, great operators see different things to other people. And you and if you if you don't spend time looking at how your people are behaving and interacting, you can't you can't coach and you can't improve. Um have you come across the invisible gorilla? Mm, yeah. I haven't, no, no. So there's a ask, can I spoil it for everyone? There's a if you go in I uh, right, there's a uh, 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 an experiment called the invisible gorilla experiment. If you go and look at it on YouTube, you can pause this now and then come back to it in a minute, and then I won't have spoiled it for you. But please do come back because otherwise I've lost Ollie a load of listeners. <laughs> um but yeah, there's an experiment called the invisible gorilla experiment. And what happens is you're uh, it's a little YouTube video. There's three people in white t-shirts. There's three people in black t-shirts and they're passing a basketball to each other, both teams. And you're, uh, it says count the number of passes that the team in white make to each other. And you sit there, you watch, you count them as passes. And halfway through the video, someone in the gorilla suit walks into the middle of the shop, does a dance, yeah, does a dance and walks off again. <laughs> yeah. And for the, the first time you watch that video, two thirds of people watching that video won't spot the gorilla. And it's because if you like the story in your head is encouraging, like the reason I'm watching this video is to watch people passing. And so you miss, you, you literally don't see it. You don't perceive it. You, you, you direct it. And that's the dynamic you get with people management. Like if you don't know you're looking for a gorilla, you ain't, you aren't going to see the gorilla. Um, and that's what great, as I say, that's what I, my experience of great people managers, great operators is they see stuff that other people don't see. Mm. And so if like, you know, practical like if you if you genuinely wanted to take something i hope a bit useful out of out the podcast is you'll give yourself time to watch watch your people watch how they're behaving and and just yeah just just see what's going on mm. and i think lots of op, like lots of restaurant managers lots of operators are so busy with stuff they don't have time to watch and if you it's, it's be a bit like being a football manager and just sitting in the stand doing your emails while the team's playing. You know, like, you, mm. if you don't see the team playing, yeah, you can't improve it. Great analogy, that. No, that, that's, that's sound advice. I think people, you know, definitely will put that to work. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting take on it. Well, something I'd love to talk to you about was, uh, and we spoke about this when we, when we first met, was about the flow state and, and what that means. And I think to any listener, they're, they're probably like, what the hell is that? So, I mean, could you talk around that a bit? Sure. So uh, flow is a concept from a, a positive psychologist guy called Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, don't ask me to spell it. Uh, in his, he was interested in like peak human experience. And for, for Csikszentmihalyi, peak human experience is like, you know, when sports people talk about being in the zone, like it's that experience. And one of the indicators that you're in that state is you, you, you get this sort of, you lose track of time, you get this distortion of time. So either things appear to be going a lot quicker or, or a lot more slowly than, than the rest of your life, if that makes sense. And like in hospitality, you have a great shift. It's like, oh my, it's like, it's already 
it's already six, I'm already off, you know? Like it's that, that's an indicator that you've been in this state of flow. And flow is where you have some nascent interest in what you're doing, a set of strengths that correspond to the task you're doing, and you're facing a challenge that's just, just very slightly stretching you. And because it's very slightly stretching you, it, you don't struggle to concentrate on it. You're like really absorbed by it. You're really in the time. I think you get it in kitchens, you know, like actually for a great chef, the flow state is probably most likely to come on the busy shift, not the quiet shift, right? Because if there's not enough challenge in the environment, but you're really good at it, you get bored. Hmm. If there's too much challenge and you're not, you haven't got the strength, you get stressed out. So there's like this channel, if you like, this flow channel of like where the strengths and the challenge are perfectly, perfectly matched. And the reason I'm interested in it is one, because that's kind of what we're trying to create with Yuda, right? It's, that's, firstly, how do you get rid of the distractions to flow, right? Hmm. So you, people can actually focus on the stuff they're interested in and want to do, which is serving customers, making great food, et cetera, not filling in a rotor or doing mm, admin. Mm, so absolutely. let's get rid of all of that. So there's fewer distractions. And then how do you use data to try and match strengths to context or strengths to challenge in a more effective way? So that's why I'm interested. And, and, and how basically, how do you get create that experience so you can be in flow more often? You know, you can, you can go, uh, you get to the end of the shift, you're like, wow, that was a great shift. You know, you have that sense of satisfaction and that sense of, You've you've done something useful and meaningful with the, the the eight hours that you've been working that day. Yeah, I think, and that that ultimately would, uh, I mean, that informs the culture of a business in some ways. Of uh, you know, when when you think about how uh, productive and enjoying, like the enjoyment that people get from doing what they do, I think that's it's a, it's just an interesting way of framing it because yeah, yeah, I think you get doing. you get this really interesting dynamic of thinking some organisations when the culture becomes detached from the actual work. Does that make sense? Like all the stuff they do around people and culture is, is if you like to compensate for the fact that we're making people work. Mm. <laughs> you know, like, oh, we need to give people an incentive or a reward or we need, you know, there needs to be a party or something. Like, like because actually we're, the work itself doesn't have the intrinsic value that we thought it did. Or, or that it yeah, absolutely. Did. Actually, I think the interesting thing is you said with flow and culture is, how do you make the work itself really satisfying? Like how do you, and really absorbing and really positive. And I'm not saying don't do the other stuff. That's great. Um, but like the, the, the number of, how would I say it? The number of organizations I think that get their, their knickers in a twist, trying to do stuff for their people. That's like, how do we just give them a cheap thrill? Like, a, like make them happy for a bit. Like mm. when actually, the more interesting bit for me is how do you re-engineer the work so the work's really absorbing and really interesting. And so people are like, I'm, I don't know, I really love my job. You don't need to, you didn't. The, well, yeah, the, they get genuine fulfillment from doing what you're doing. I yeah. think that's so important. And well, it, going back to what you said at the start, where you think yeah, in, in your life <laughs> and the percentage of time or literally the number of years you spend doing something, you've got to make the most of it and make it enjoyable. Yeah, I don't know if this is a personal, like, like everyone's got their own sort of history and like bias and what have you. I, I quite, like, I'm one of those people. I like working. Like, if you give me, like, I want to work. Like, you give me a day off. I'm, I'm not, I've, I feel a bit uncomfortable and a bit itchy in my skin if I'm not working. No. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate not everyone, like, people, but I think there's, yeah, we just, we'll, we'll just try and create good work for, for people um, and focus on, like, the number of, organizations who I think just perhaps without realizing it undermine the satisfaction people get from their work you know mm. like if you start cheating on ingredients and stuff okay there's a little cost saving but what are you doing to the pro you know the sense of pride that a chef feels about putting that plate together mm. you know if you do some if you asking for customer feedback right you see such clumsy systems for how people do that and what you're really saying for the person who's like if I've you know when you've sat at a table and you've had a nice experience, the 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 person serving your table is great, and then the whole of it's undermined at the end by like, could you give me some feedback? In a way that feels like, oh, you've just made it really transactional, you mm -hmm. know. And actually, you don't realize it, but these things really cut away at people's intrinsic satisfaction in what they do and their sense of dignity in what they do and why they do it. Um, 
yeah, like I've just done a great job of serving you your table because I wanted some great feedback because it might get me a little bit of an extra reward. Like, do you know what I mean? It just sort totally. of cuts away at, yeah, yeah. at the 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 essence of the job, and I think you have to be quite careful with that stuff. Yeah, you're saying that for the well for for the the person who's asking for the feedback and and also from the customer. The customer. Like, you, like <laughs> yeah. I've, have you not been? You've been like, or the worst one is when they give you it and they explicitly say, you know, if you say nice things about me, I get a little bonus. Hmm. It's like, oh, it just it just kills the whole the whole. But it happens, and I understand why it happens. People people want to people want they've been incentivized to do that mm-hmm. like it, it's and that's why i think you know you, you know we talked before about the that sort of difference between seeing the system and seeing the component like that's a component solution you know we're going to put some incentives around customer experience because we want to improve customer experience now you, it doesn't work you got to change the system mm-hmm. um you got to think about it from a much more holistic perspective uh because yeah otherwise you try and take shortcuts that aren't sustainable that end up undermining the you know the core of what you're trying to do as an organization that is a very interesting perspective I, i'd love to talk to you about community and and from your perspective the importance of this within hospitality more for shared best practice and and from a competitive you know healthy competition perspective yeah it's really interesting i think you're right hospitality does have a unusually uh communal feel to it in the way in which people collaborate so i've worked with you know rapid growth tech businesses, biotech, financial service. I've done like everything, right, as a consultant. Uh, and, and and hospitality is definitely the most supportive between businesses, which is great. Like, it's really great. Um, but I ju- you need the competition too, if that makes sense. Like, um, I think, you know, if I was being, I don't want to sound rude or con- like deliberately controversial, but the truth is, the shortage of labor at the moment is a good thing in the long run. It's going to drive up standards around people experience people, businesses that aren't treating their people well enough. And who have got away with that for a long period of time are going to go out of business. And in my, that's a good thing. That's how the market should work. So I think for me, what's interesting I'm observing, particularly in the people space in the community is like, how do you, it's almost like putting together like, um, like a rowing team, right? Like, like, how can you collaborate with people who share your value? So we'll put a boat of eight together or whatever it is of, of people, like, because we can all make each other go faster, but we want to beat the other boats. And that's what I'm I'm excited about seeing is, um, so they're in the people space, there's like little clusters of people who, who, who care about their people, care about their culture, want to take a data-led approach to that, um, who are starting to share their data uh, and share, you know, what's driving their data and what they're learning from that which I think is a really great thing. I'm really skeptical about, um, you know, some of the stuff about in- industry wide stuff that, that, that sort of papers over the cracks. Does that make sense? Like, mm. I, I, so yeah, if, if anyone's interested in this, I'd like my tip, get in touch with a guy called Phil Eels, who's one of the co-founders at Honest. He's doing some work at the moment around creating some benchmarks around people and culture data um, and sharing those so people can work out, you know, uh, both where they where they sit, get some more insight into that, but also as a bit of a community and a conversation around how we can actually do stuff that would change these numbers over time, how we can learn to get better. Because to your, like, there's not best practice. Like no one knows how to do this at the moment. Uh, we're not at that stage. What we're at the stage of is for the first time starting to get to a place where people can get interesting data that actually tells them stuff. And mm-hmm. then, then people are going to need to start experimenting to work out what works for them. Mm. Um, there isn't at the moment like a manual of best practice you can take off the, the wall and, and implement it just well you're like, saying specifically to people, people management people yeah management, yeah, people management, yeah. yeah because from an operational standpoint I think we see that from an, like with with day-to-day operations and stuff and it there there is and there isn't like I mean there's, there's best practice are ever evolving and obviously incredibly disruptive technologies come through and then make change best practice to be completely different. So, but it, it, it's very interesting. And that, that's a good tip as well for people to go and have a if look. If you're a people person at the moment, this is one of the interesting dynamics. I think people, people feel under pressure from their peers around a, a leadership table to have the answer to stuff. 
And so it creates this dynamic where it's like, we've got a recruitment problem, solve it. Or we've got a service problem, go and solve it. And then the people who go away and design something, it usually takes them like six months, 12 months, whatever it is. And then they release it to the business. And then very rarely do they put a feedback loop on that in about whether it's been effective. And actually, it's quite difficult to put a feedback loop on that because if it doesn't work, you're a bit professionally exposed. Like, why did you spend six months building something that doesn't work? Uh, my like if it, people people my my if i may my like a, like advice or experience of working in consultant is you you need to take a much more experimental approach you need to get stuff out there quicker generate data which helps you improve and worry less about having the right answer because like you know i've been i've been doing this for like 10 15 years like i take the job pretty seriously like i've <laughs> I read like I, did, I read around it. I can tell you with the like in my humble opinion, no one's got the answer, right? Mm. No one can tell you how do I make my people happier in a way that spills over to better. So, like, so what you need to do is construct uh, a, 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 a system where you can an experiment. You can say, okay, how do we improve our recruitment process? How are we generating more data around what's working, what's not working? How do we change that um, rather than like thinking that there's someone's got an answer that you could just implement into your business and it would get you those results. It just doesn't work like that. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, cause that, that has to be, that has to be right at the core of the business as well. And it has to be, for, I mean, say from the top down, everyone that is it, sort of the, whoever's leading that business or the leaders within that business must be absolutely practicing what they preach and, and supportive of mistakes. And the, I guess, Ego is a is a risk in something like that because the fear of you know we can't be wrong and can't admit when you're wrong and those things where it's like no it's a fantastic lesson to carry forwards let's let's move forwards like that and you know I think there's a really important lesson in that yeah and, and this again you, you know so a huge motivation for for what we're trying to do with Uda like I want to give people the tools that enable them to experiment mm. and then experiments are success regardless of the result does that make sense if you just generate a result that disproves your hypothesis you've learned something it's a success mm. right and you haven't put something into your business and then just carried on with it for three years without realizing it was actually not working for you so i'm a huge believer that people practitioners need to see themselves as like how do i how do i run experiments whether that's on my recruitment process, onboarding, learning experiences, whatever it might be, how do I generate the data that helps me understand what's working and what's not working? And how do I just get into this, this rhythm of constantly iterating and constantly looking for those improvements and the changes you need to make? Um, and, and you're just about trying to give you the tools to do that. That's, that's really what it's about. It, uh, because I think in, in the people space, everyone's grown up with a set of technology that basically told you how you ought to manage your people. There wasn't the flexibility to do it how you wanted to, and it didn't have the data that, that gave you any insight into what was really working and what wasn't working. That's really interesting. Now, with, with taking a bigger step back and you and your journey, I mean, you, you're an entrepreneur, you're starting a technology business. What's the, to anyone listening who, who possibly is thinking about uh starting up their own business or whatever, you know, what's that journey been like for you so far? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I'd be the best person to get any advice from. Um, uh, it's tough. Like starting a business is tough. I think um, when, you, when you're an entrepreneur, when you're trying to start something, it's very difficult to convey how all-consuming that becomes for you to someone who's doing a job if that makes sense. There's, a, in my mind, a very different experience to to trying to start and create an organisation that that yeah, it's just mentally all consuming. You know, it doesn't. It, 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 and you have these massive emotional highs and lows as things hit you along the way. Um, and yeah, candidly, like I, I wouldn't be necessarily be an advocate for it. So that means like I wouldn't say, oh, go and start a business. It's amazing, great. It's it's not. It's it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of um yeah just that emotional roller coaster of being so so in so closely associated with what you're trying to do is 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 tough on the other hand it's great it's all consuming it's like you can get to do your thing you can mm. you can test yourself you, i think it's like i don't know i i tried to like i, I was trying to find trying to explain some i guess it's a bit like running ultra marathons or something like that like i'm not an ultra marathon runner or anything i, I to the outside it seems like a completely pointless 
exactly, you know, like why would anyone bother doing that? But I think when you're in it, you just you just can't stop. It becomes slightly addictive. It becomes like, yeah, like you you just you just yeah, and you've got this uh, you know this vision of this what you want to create and what you want to do for people and the impact you want that you hope that might have. Um, yeah, it's quite it's quite intense. I think is 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 how I describe it. Have you done any ultra marathons? No, I haven't. <laughs> no, I have no, no interest in doing an ultra no. marathon. But uh, I, I get what you're saying though, right? So it sort of it becomes a part of your. I haven't identity. even done a, like a half marathon. I'm not even that <laughs> yeah. stupid. Oh yeah, but no, I, I get what you're saying. Where it sort of it becomes a part of your identity, effectively. I mean, it's your baby. You are so focused on it, and you know it. it, it it lives or dies based on what you do, and and that's that's especially from a starting point is is huge. Yeah, and and the number of things that you've got to keep juggling when you're starting to to, to keep things moving forward is is um, yes, it, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, and and by means of achieving that and actually going out to start your own business, you're on a fundraising journey. Um, I mean, could you share what that's been like in terms of how you've gone about that? The, the, the sort of just a, a very light education into what that world looks like for people. Sure, but I mean, like I'm at this. We're at the start, so we're 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 looking to raise a pre-seed round at the moment. So we're right at the start of the journey, and and um, I'd yeah, I sugar, I'd, I'd sort of yeah, you know, anything I say, I would I would defer to people who've been a bit further down the line. Um, we've been really lucky in that um, you know. Uh, we've been able to raise some money from people who, who who we knew and people who are you know founders in the hospitality industry who've had firsthand experience of the problem we're trying to solve and and those sorts of things. So, um, it, and it's really it's really humbling when people back you. You know, like they they people are giving you not insignificant money to go because they think you're onto something and they they want to see you succeed. Um, so yeah, it's been that bit of it's. It, uh, yeah I can't, it's quite humbling like you're like oh okay uh, but also this then you get this sense of responsibility like someone's given me this chunk of money to go and do this and you can't you, you've got to sort of carry that um so yeah we're we're at the, we're we're still at sort of angel stage you know that early stage of of, of uh raising money um i think the last nine months or so has been a tough environment to raise money like <laughs> if you're a tech company um uh, but yeah, it's um, it's really interesting, and and you know the the VCs we've spoken to, and and who might be interested in this a bit further down the line, again, that's a really interesting. One of the things I've observed is a really interesting cultural difference between talking to VCs in the states and the UK. Like the UK, there's a degree of cynicism about what you're trying to, you know, like what about this? Does this really? You go to the states, and the conversation is a completely different dynamic. It's like um, but what if this happened? And what if this happened? And what if this? And they multiply all the good things that could happen to you. And suddenly mm. it's like, yeah, but you could be twenty times bigger than you thought you could be in in half the time. And it's just really, um, yeah, just a really interesting uh, difference about uh, people's appetite for risk and appetite for adventure. Um, I guess my, as I say, I wouldn't take advice from me. I'm way too early on the the journey. Um, but the, the the advice I have from people is just try try and find investors who fit with what you want to do and how you see the world. And you've got that good connection with rather than just taking money from anyone who offers it, um, would be, would be, uh, yeah. If I could offer any advice, I think it would be that. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a long-term relationship, I guess. And well, hopefully it's a long-term relationship, but then when, uh, in terms of how do you actually, you know, find just introduce yourself to these people? How do you, how do you make those connections? How does it work? I think in my in our case it it's existing relationships it's like it's people i i know from the industry that i've worked for over the course of the last 10 15 years um uh one of us was actually someone we turned up to sell to a uh, hospitality business and the founder took took me aside at the end it's like actually i i think you're onto something i'd quite like to invest as well as buying it which was like a good day you know you think you pick up a customer <laughs> and invest an investor the same day um uh I think it's quite difficult early stage to get money from people who are strangers to you because really they're backing you, right? They're backing you and your idea. There's not, there isn't anything in the business. You, you know, we're, we're pre evidence of product market fit. You know, there isn't anything you can hang your hat on. So, so I think to convince a stranger to invest in you at that point is quite tough. 
Um, so yeah, finding people who you've either worked with in the past or, uh, or, or, or that, you know, that, you know, people who you know who can introduce you with a degree of confidence. That's, that's where all our better conversations have come from rather than trying to cold contact angels or cold contact people. Mm. Um, yeah, I'd go first to people who know you. Yeah, that, that's really good advice. Um, and in terms of new technologies coming through into the industry, I, I mean, there's obviously been a, a big wave around AI, but uh, even things like virtual reality, mi mixed reality, all of that stuff. I mean, applications for that, have, uh, what, what do you see as sort of, I guess, innovations for the future around these things? Yeah, well, uh, virtual reality stuff, mixed reality stuff, augmented reality stuff, I've yet to see a knockout use case, if that makes sense. I've yet to see anything that I'm going, oh, that's a, like that completely changes the game. I'm not sure. So I'm a bit skeptical about that. AI is, is going to be huge. AI is going to be, is going to completely change. And it's, and the speed with which things are developing is, is astounding. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, we, you will have its first AI uh, application before the end of the summer. Um, and, uh, e with even with the simple stuff you can plug in at this point, you can you can significantly change the user experience. The longer term piece for Udor on AI is 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 twofold. One uh, around what's called natural language processing, so how you use AI to make sense of language. Um, and the big opportunity for us in that space is, at the, in my opinion, at the moment, employee feedback is 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 impoverished at the point of capture, right? When you ask for employee for some, it's, it's, as soon as you get to any scale, right? You get to 200 people plus. If you want to find anything out from your employees, basically you have to turn it into a Likert scale of very dissatisfied to very satisfied. Yeah, you've got to turn it. Mm -hmm. And and the problem is if you say, what did you think about our recruitment process? Very dissatisfied to very, you don't actually learn very much. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Well, how was your shift one to five? If you say to someone, just ask an open question, like how was your shift? And they tell you how the shift was, and you can use the AI to make sense of that. Suddenly, the level of insight you can get from employees at scale changes. So that's that's one of our areas of focus. And then ultimately, with Uda, it's about how you use AI to try and identify the causal relationships in the system. So for us, what do you need to know about an individual and the context in which they're working in order to be able to predict an outcome or to nudge someone towards a better outcome? Um, and that could be potentially very, very big. Yeah, that's, that it sounds absolutely fascinating. And I think if as more and more, uh, well, the uptake and it sort of becomes more familiar with with folks as well, things like AI, the the untapped potential is is significant. Yeah, I think it's not. I think people think about AI and they think they're going to have to be like a data science, and that's what's not. Mm. It's what's really interesting is that the 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 user experience of using it will will is is going to be it will end up like google search in in but the next frontier of that if that makes sense like you know the 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 triumph of google search is everyone can do it like my you know my kids can do it my even my dad can do it you know, like you got that, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. and it'll be the same with ai like you will be able to you know in the future you if you're a people practitioner you'll be able to go onto udo and you'll be able to say you know run me a scenario where we don't we freeze hiring for six weeks what would happen or run me a scenario where this or tell me what are the best predictors of this outcome and it'd be like it's like having a, a suddenly having a data scientist on your team who can who can who can go and look at that data and come back to you with an answer um or like we'll just pop up you know when we're not too far away with you know with you know you'll get an email that says by the way um we've noticed that you're onboarding process isn't working for people who also happen to be students. We think you should run these three tests to see if you can change that. Mm. And as I say, I think it's a bit like being Batman. Do you know what I mean? Like you just suddenly yeah, got this, yeah, this technology that, yeah. that allows you to focus your time on the way you can really make a difference. Um, and that's what the data is about. Yeah, uh, and I think that's, that's definitely going to help. I mean, there's a lot of fear and uncertainty around it. And I think... I think the, the old expression of Henry Ford and and if he, if he did what people said, then they want faster horses, not a car. But it, it's just, it, it's it's going to be great as it hits the mainstream and people get more familiar with it. I think. I come back to the point I was saying before about it taking out jobs in reverse order, right? Mm. If I was a lawyer, I'd be really worried about AI. 
if I'm working in hospitality, I wouldn't be. In hospitality, AI is going to make my job easier and better. In law, AI may well replace big chunks of my job, um, particularly for more junior lawyers. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, I think it's it, it is interesting, and it won't be a it won't be a like a universal effect if that makes sense. Like though, it will obviously create new opportunities and new markets and new jobs and new industries. In other industries, lots of lots of jobs could go potentially. Uh, I think in hospitality, it's more likely that the experience changes fundamentally for people, but but it's not going to threaten the industry. D- does that make sense? No, I think c- it's certainly, certainly. I, th- well, I think it's going to enable people to be less reactive, more proactive about their business and will drive better outcomes for hospitality businesses. It will absolutely. But even, even that where you say like uh, around things like uh, like white collar jobs like and and the law profession and software development and various other bits the the the, the risk is the people who are using it need to know you know they need to be experts of what they do uh, to make sure otherwise yeah by the way know, i should preface this like my 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 i, I did a law degree i was with the world's law, worst lawyer uh <laughs> so like this is why i'm like oh, go on take out all the legal jobs uh, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's going to be fascinating, and it is it is fascinating. And now, I just I'd love to take a step to the other side of the bar, and um, you know, ask you a question that we ask all our guests, which is which is, as a customer, what do you feel like? Yeah, as a as a customer experience, what do you feel like any hospitality experience doesn't get right? What do I think it doesn't get right? I can't. The best hospitality businesses, I think, have this ability to keep things really simple, right? It's not like, you you know, like a simple menu that's put together really well or a sim- like a simple proposition. Um, don't, don't make it fussy, you know, don't like, don't over-engineer the customer journey. Don't make it feel, and there's that, that ability to create an environment where someone can go in and relax and have the experience they want. Um, and I think, yeah, too much, pro- too much process in the customer journey is the thing that really, really irritates me. Um, and when you just get away from the fundamentals, like when you feel like the food quality is not right, or you feel like the team members aren't happy or, you know, I, I don't think it, it, I say it's simple. It's not, it's not easy to create, but that doesn't mean it can't be simple. Hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, so so keep it simple, keep it authentic. Yeah, keep just just like there there the the there are a few things that really matter. Like you know, if you're eating, does it taste good? Is it well prepared? Like, are you sat somewhere that feels comfortable? Like, just and the rest of it, just you can just lose. I think just you know, and that mm. makes everyone's life a bit easier and a bit able to focus on on what matters, um, and just that that thing that's really hard to articulate, but that skill that like someone's, you know, front of house, that ability to make people feel welcome and comfortable and to read like, oh, this customer wants to chat and and this one just wants to be left alone, you know, and that, and, and that changes over time. As in I could walk in some places someday and I just want to be left alone. And there's other days I walk in and I do want to be, uh, to have a chat. And that, that yeah, that ability to read people, I think, is really and and to respond to people is is really important. This is good skill. I mean, the experience, absolutely. I, it, you just mentioned that, and it made me think of something where I saw I saw uh, it was an example of an Uber, an exceptional service, where it's like getting in a someone gets in the taxi and they give them a thing where it's like, would you like me to be talkative or would you like me to just leave you to it? Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's quite. You got to do that. You got to do that without actually explicitly asking it. That's the thing. You got like, how do I read the? How do I read this person to work out what they're looking for? Are, you know, they're looking for me to engage with them or not. And I think that's the thing that that makes a huge difference. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then for yourself, like if, if with what you know now in your experience and in your infinite wisdom uh, and you're starting out again on your career, what, what, what would you tell yourself? What would be the one key, key thing that you'd tell yourself? Uh, <laughs> a key learning. Key learning. Yeah, I think, I think the irony of this is the, the, you're, you're, you're very, like the infinite wisdom. I'm less stumped. I haven't got anything. Um, what would my key learning be? Um, I think 
go and expose yourself to stuff and go and like go and uh if you're curious about something just follow up on it just go and, like and and uh i think people are when you start out when and i'm particularly when you, you get pigeonholed quite quickly in terms of um why you're here and what you ought to do and 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 actually people are much more receptive to you challenging stuff and going for a bit of an explore and being a bit difficult. I was really lucky. One of my first, I used to work for a big manufacturing group. I used to work for the HR director and, and the finance director. And, and I was sort of, I didn't really, I, I, I didn't really have a job, if that makes sense. I, I, I just got to play with things and do little bits and pieces. And they, they both gave me this license to go and be curious and ask questions and, you know, why, why do we do it like this? And what if we did it like this? And, um, I, the reason you, I don't know if you, you know, yeah, I, I hope you is going to be a huge success, obviously. Um, but you the culmination of, of 15 years of being curious and going and trying stuff. And, um, most of the stuff I tried didn't work or it was a, you know, in fact, it was a qualified success, you know, like it, it did something, but it didn't do quite what we expected or it didn't deliver a scale that we expected. Um, and, and being able to explore problems and, and keep exploring the same problem over a period of time is like, you can get to a level where you're like, actually, I think I, I think I've seen something now. I think I've got something. I think I, um, and you can't do that if you just, if you stay in the lane, does, does that make sense? It's like if you just turn mm. up and do what people ask you to do, you won't you won't ever um, go and see things that the other people have missed. Yeah, that's really good advice. Uh, it's sound because explore, throw yourself in the deep end, yeah, go for the challenge. And the... Don't worry if you mess up. Like like if you mess up with honesty and integrity, people respect that. And actually, some of the most valuable things I did as consult- I mean that in terms of the financial world, the value is just things that didn't work. Like I tried something, I didn't work. I could explain why I didn't think it worked, and that set that company on a different path where they saved an awful lot of money. Um, yeah, so don't. I think it's this, um, and I do worry. Again, don't want to sound too uh, soapboxy, but like I do worry that we've got an education system where we tell people for fifteen years it's really important that you're right when you're tested that you're right. You, you know must the pass. answer. You must know the answer, <laughs> and your intelligence is about whether you can have the answer at the right moment in time. And actually, I think the value in the world of work is not that. It's about your ability to understand and construct a problem and work out how you might address that problem. Um, And often the starting point from that is your confidence to admit you don't have a clue what the answer is. And and yeah, the structure around that as well, when you think about the education system. And then it's yeah you're you're just focused on passing and and, and going. We, and it's, I think it's, you made this point before about like how we perceive jobs. Like in the education system, we the smart person, the valuable person, is the person who has the answer. Hmm. Um, it's not, and that's not really where life is now. Like it's you know, particularly with technology, this like that, that the te- you, you want to know any answer in the world, the technology can find it for you. Like. It's actually constructing the problem, understanding what you're trying to pr- fix, understanding how you can create a process that would fix that problem or make that problem better. I think that's where the that's where you create value for for organisations, um, and that's not something I think we encourage in in the education system. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely fundamental. Uh, and last question is, you know, what's next for you? More well, you do. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're, um, uh, we are at that stage where now we've got a good, decent version one of the product. Uh, we're excited about what it can do. We're really excited when we get nice feedback from customers and that sort of thing. Uh, and we're looking to find other organizations who, 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 who you know, might want to try it and get on board. I think it's what we're discovering is it's it's useful for for hospitality companies once they get past about 150 odd people so once you get that social complexity in a business that means when you've got say five or six sites as a founder you can turn up you know people and then you get to that point where you turn up and you're like oh i don't actually know the people who are now working in my restaurant as soon as you get to that point i think you does a good uh a, a, well i think it's, actually i think it's critical like once you get you need to you have a system then that's starting to 
be able to support culture at scale. So anything from about 150 up to thousands of people um, and anyone who wants to, is genuinely wants to create a good culture, genuinely wants to create a great people experience, anyone who's feeling a bit frustrated with what the technology currently allows them to do, um, we need to find those people. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's the next six to 12 months for us. Awesome. Well, Matt, thank you. Oh, that was a perfect place to finish. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on. My and pleasure. it's been fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really excited for you and what you're doing. Thank you. That's very kind. Well, there you have it. I hope you found my discussion with Matt useful and that you learn as much as I did. And I really do truly hope that there are a number of takeaway uh, items that you could put to work within your own business following on from this to the benefit of your of your people. But if if you do have any comments, thoughts, feedback, don't hesitate to get in touch. My, my contact details are on the screen. Um, but otherwise, this is the Recipes for Success podcast. Thank you for listening. <music>